Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. We're going to continue looking at Daniel chapter 11, verse 36. Uh, but before we begin, uh, can you join me in a word of prayer? But dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this new week and that you have brought us through the past week. We know, Lord, that uh, there is many difficulties that we face in this life, in this world of sin and suffering. And we pray for Brother Dwight and his family and his mom, that you can help him in the trials that he's facing and that his mom is facing. We know, Lord, that your purposes are always worked out as we yield to you and your will. And so we just leave everything in your hands. We ask that um, we can be drawn close to you, that we can trust in you. You know, our situations you know, the things in our heart that need to change. And so we just ask for your spirit's power in our lives and in this study. Thank you, Lord, for all the things that you are doing. And we pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's nice to see everybody here this morning. We got uh, you know, Brother Dwight's here, but he's probably going to leave right away. So we've been praying for his mom and for Dwight. Now. Uh, just a quick, quick review. So on Thursday, we were studying about the 45 years and it was pretty interesting. Um, you know, first it was my wife's 45th birthday. So I thought that was kind of interesting. It wasn't intentional. Uh, but the 45 years, uh, we looked at uh, a chart or a line that Stephen had done, which, uh, I thought was rather interesting. And then. We, we addressed a little bit, uh, I can't remember exactly how much we talked about it, but there is this, uh, 82,499, which is the gematria, not the gematria, but the lexical number of Daniel 11 verse 36. So 82,499. And if we took that as days, uh, we could count that from February 15th, 1798. Now, you know, the idea that we do this is not, is just that God has done it, right? So when it comes to the present truth application, now we know even, even not in the present truth application, but in, in other applications, that sometimes the numbers themselves, like when we deal with the word uh, that's translated as times, it's a number that can symbolize 360 because six times five by whatever it is. I can't remember the number, but it, you know, it can add up to 360 and it's used in a place where in the historical application it's referring to a period of 360 years, even for a time, right? And so, so that's pretty interesting that these Hebrew numbers do that. And we have had verses where when we add the entire verse together, uh, it's a significant span of time that, yeah, that's uh, 6256. Thanks, Angela, H6256 time. That when we add, you know, the entire verse together, it, it works into a span of time that fit perfectly into uh, the lines connecting events of the past with the present. So I just want to finish off a little bit about these these 45 years. Now, when we look at Daniel 11, verse 36, the king shall do according to his will. And we know historically that this is referring to papal Rome, right? So this is this is the papacy. It's not France, as the pioneers and Uriah Smith suggested. And they suggested that based upon Alexander Keith, his studies on these verses. And they just seem to accept that even though it was a mixture of, it, it would go contrary to Miller's rules. The idea that you're going to have the king of the north still be the one that occupies the territory of Syria instead of being a spiritual power, I think is, is just a major problem that they had. And, and they're going to recognize the king of the north is 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 the papacy, and then all of a sudden this king, and it says the king, not a king. So the king shall do according to his will. 
and this is 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 showing this this the this power this papal power that is one of the major major kingdoms that is acting out this history and we know that rome is the one that establishes the vision and and this is about rome and so we're going to see you know obviously first pagan rome crucifies christ right and then we have the rise of papal rome and we see that transition happening you know verse 31 right the daily being taken away the abomination of desolation being set up now this is going to bring us to the end of the 1260 so even though it's talking about the papacy and its work during the 1260 it's going to say the king shall do according to his will and he shall exalt himself and magnify uh, himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. Right. So that's going to be 1798. And that that is determined. That is that is cut off of that. It's this 45 years shall be done. So it's just saying that we're going to come to the end of the indignation. And then there's this thing that's determined. And that's the 45 years. And we compare this with Daniel chapter 12. And so we can see that it's the 1290 and the 1335. So this is historically how we understand these verses. Now, in creating the present truth application, that means we would be connecting this 45 years to events in our history within the movement. So that that's how we would do this. Right. So I, I think it's really clear to those who have been following this that that this is that this is a valid way of understanding our lines at the present by comparing it to the past. So we know that papal Rome in that period of 1260 has a parallel to our time, but it's going to happen through the image of the beast by the United States. So one of the things that we, we've done with these verses here is we've compared Revelation 12 and 13 with this and, and even Revelation 11 with this history here that we can see that there is that it's it's describing the same thing as this history. Right. So it's going to talk about the dragon, the red dragon. That's pagan Rome. It's also a symbol of Satan, but primarily Satan, but in a secondary sense, pagan Rome. And then you have the beast, the papacy. That is this composite beast. It has all the characteristics of all these different nations that did according to their will. But now it's going to be that that last beast or, or, or the last of it's not the last beast, but the, the, the next beast, I guess you would say. Then the United States follows the two horned beast. Now, it's it's going to be addressing that in a sense with this 45 years. So with the end of the indignation, we have. This, these events that are going to happen in these 45 years. And then we connect that to our history. So when we do this, we take the lexical sum of a verse. We, we can't just take it and do whatever we want with it, right? That 82,499 is what that verse shows. So I'm going to just go through this slowly. So we have here this verse. Now, you can you can see we have the verse itself, and then we have a gematria of the verse. But we also have this this portion: the king shall do according to his will, and shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every. So, Aran, can you explain why this is singled out? Yeah, that's just if you select something, and it looks like it might also have the number in there, the eleven thirty six. So it's including the eleven thirty six in that sum not the verse. Now, how, how did we, how did it end up like this? Did I do that? Yeah. If you just select a phrase or a word or something, it will oh, okay, go in okay. there. Okay. I see. So if I do that, okay. So that's what ended up happening. So I had selected that. I was wondering why that was. Okay. So we can just kind of ignore that. Okay. Yeah. That was, that was confusing me the other day. Okay. So you can see the lexical sum is 82,499. And if I go, I guess, here to the calendar converter, 
We've got some stuff in here. Don't know what that is, but I'm just going to go to 1798. And I'm going to go to February 15th. Now, there's two different ways we could count this. Of course, I could count it just a cardinal count. So I'll, put, I'll save that. And I go 82,499. And it's going to bring me to January 1st, 2024. Now, we know that that's going to be uh, connecting the start of that 45 years, the end of the indignation. And it's going to be con taking that verse and bringing it into our history. Now, if we go to, to the first day of the first month in 2024, it brings it to this year. And we already had, and you could remember from the study yesterday, we, we dealt with the first day of the first month, which was April 10th, 2024, on the biblical calendar. And that the first day of the first month uh, symbolizes a number of things, right? Obviously, it, the arrival of the second angel uh, in, in Millerite history. 9-11 uh, can be symbolized as that. Uh, but we also know from the first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month, is the period of the divorcement. So we dealt with that in the study yesterday. So the thing that's that's interesting here is we have this first day, the first month in 2024. And I'm suggesting, this is my opinion, uh, that that this refers to within this movement, this divorcement that is occurring. Now, uh, two days prior to January 1st, 2024, so this would be the third day, uh, you know, Jeff is going to speak for the first time uh, 1260 days after July 18. So I'm, I'm just suggesting that either, you know, when we get to the 31st of December, that's going to be the day after we end up discussing that. So this in addressing this, this 45 years, how would the 45 years be connected with our history? What's the symbol there? The 45 years. Can, can, is this just something that doesn't really mean anything or is it something that, that we can understand? Because we're dealing with the 45 years here. Now, this verse, of course, we could say, well, this verse is addressing lots of things, but it's really addressing the end of the 1260 and the beginning of the 45 years. Right. So obviously it's describing the man of sin, the papacy from Second Thessalonians, Great Controversy, Chapter three. It's all that history condensed in this verse. So it's describing this characteristic of the papacy. But it's going to prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. So that that it is determined is something that occurs after the end of the indignation. That is, you need the end of the indignation. You need these 45 years in order for this to be done, right? That's the thing that needs to be done. And any thoughts about that? If, if we're going to just even in the historical application, does that make sense to people that it's that that is determined is Angela notes that 89 plus 45 is 144. Okay. Interesting. Is it 140? Well, I was just I thinking think of when, when the movement started with Jeff, Jeff and Kathy, right? And so it's 134. It's 134 though. But anyway. Uh, oh, okay. Well, there's my great math for you. Yeah, that's okay. What if the one three four stands for something important? <laughs> Not that I know of. So anyway, this idea that these 45 years uh, connect, uh, to me is clear that, that 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 is determined. And, and we remember we looked at this. I'm um, just going to, I can't remember exactly which word it was. Didn't you look up the word determine? Yeah, yeah, we looked up the word determine, and I'm going to do that again. Yeah, karats. So it's a uh, means to point and to sharpen, to decide, to cut, right? So the idea is it can be something that's cut out, right? That 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 is a decisive, because you can even think of the word like uh, decisive has in it like the idea of cutting something. Okay. So, so that, that is determined or, or cut. Cutting so, off or something. So that's the way that I think of it. It's, it's the part that's cut off, um, of that bigger prophecy, 
right? So there's there's portions of these prophecies. So, I mean, it is a decree. It can be determined or a decree or to decide, to sharpen, to move, to be decisive, uh, to be mutilated. But uh, I think here that it's it's just that these 45 years are, are cut out of these, these prophecies after the indignation is accomplished. So we have the two 2520s, the 45 years is part of that, right? So that, that's the way that I understand it. And I was just trying to remember the form that this word is in. Yeah, so the, the word is in the nifal form. So that has to do with to be decisive. But but you can see how the word decisive means to cut. Like to make a decision is to to cut something, right? That's that's the basic idea of that word decisive. It it has to do with, with cutting, right? So that's why. So anyway, that's the way that I take it. It's these 45 years. And, and, and shall be done. So these 45 years is this period of time. Now I've tried to deal with the 6213. Now that word shows up a lot, but I, I tried to see how does that relate to, uh, the 45 years? And I haven't really found anything that fits. So I'm not sure if it, you know, just the, the Hebrew number there matters, but for the whole verse, we can see that it's going to bring us to 2024. Now, I put there the, the Trump prophecy just in this general sense, because Trump, Trump is the 45th president. And we have this this prophecy that we predicted, right, that Trump would become the 45th president. And he fulfills this role. But there is is something that is determined in our history that is is cut off. So a person could look at it and say, well, the Trump prophecy is going to be fulfilled in 2024. Right. They could say you came to the first day of the first month in 2024. They could say that, except that they've rejected the symbolic use of numbers. So I don't know that they can do that and be consistent, if you understand what I'm saying. So a lot of the things that they've been using to try to have Trump bring in the Sunday law with spans of time and symbols of numbers, they're going to have to abandon because of Jeff's position and because of the divorcement in the movement. And they've been misusing these things because if you can't put these things properly on a line and show their significance, a symbol, a symbol doesn't mean anything if it's not put into a context. And that context is the lines that we have from Millerite history. So we can say here, you know, maybe a better way to put this is, you know, we got the Trump prophecy in here, but we could just say uh, the 45th president. So the 45th president being Trump, I'll put here being Trump, relates to uh, the end of that, that prediction, right? That is, we would say that the 45 years, uh, the role of Trump, that with the divorcement, that that's now, we need to set that aside as be, having been fulfilled. Trump has fulfilled his role, both uh, within the, uh, the context of, of the prophecy itself of what we wanted Trump to represent, right? He represents Xerxes, but also that the movement would have to be abandoning that. Now, it doesn't mean that they are because, you know, Jeff is going to say, well, Trump's going to become the president. He's going to bring in the Sunday law and all that. But we can now see that any validity in trying to apply Trump now prophetically would not make sense that is trump has fulfilled his role he's still there as a person you know he still could either be elected or not elected it's definitely what we're looking for is something that happens beyond that so so if we're going to look at this history here uh, the king of the north the papacy through the image of the beast by the usa you know this is bringing us to our line lines and and this we know when he does according to his will well this refers to the sunday law crisis so uh, and then we have now this sunday law crisis has occurred or we are in the sunday law crisis already right so we've been in the sunday law crisis since 9 11 but we've also been in a sunday law crisis in type during the time of the pandemic so that was a type of the Sunday law. 
And now we have January 6, 2021, and we put that in there. We're saying that the indignation was accomplished in January 6, 2021. So we're saying, well, if you're saying that the 1260 ended there, you know, we're not necessarily saying the 1260 ended there, but we're saying that that something ended there in which 1798 is representative. Now, we may have to refine that, right? We may, we may think this through and think of it in some other way. So the, the papacy obviously is, is the one that was working with the United States, right? The United States had, had joined hands with the papal power. Now and we're going to look at some spirit of prophecy quotes addressing this. So let's, let's go over here uh, to LG White Disc. Okay, reach across. Okay, so we're just going to look at some of these these verses because I think this is this is going to help us quite a bit to understand what's happening. Now, Ellen White says through two great errors: immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness. Satan will bring the people under his deceptions, while the former lays the foundation of spiritualism. So, spiritualism is connected to the to what power so when when we talk about spiritualism how how do we understand that spiritualism so it's the dragon power and the latter creates a bond of sympathy with rome so that is sunday sacredness so the protestants of the united states will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism they will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling the rights of conscience. So we know here uh, when it says that they, I'm just looking at the order here. We're going to look at this in other places. But um, in the order here, it says that the United, the Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hands of spiritualism, right? So we know that that happens. And there, she's going to mention this one first, but she doesn't say, say then will they reach. She just says they will reach over the abyss to clasp the hands with the Roman power. So, so it doesn't show that this is happening in any sequence. And we would say, well, the United States has already clasped hands with the Roman power. And we, we could put that into the history of, um, the 1980s with Reagan and Pope John Paul II. And then we said, well, when did they uh, stretch across the, the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism? Well, is there is there some specific date that we would have that this occurred? Now, now often what we do is we say, well, with 9-11, there is, um, and, and we've seen this since then, of the connection of the United States with the UN. But you could say the UN, well, it's been there a long time. But but she must be talking about something in a much more specific way. And, and one of the things we can say in the context, at least of this movement, is that if we're going to apply this to this movement, we're going to see that the January 6th is grasping the hand of spiritualism. Now, that means the next would be to clasp hands with the Roman power, if, if that's the case of how we would look at it. Now, in this one, you're going to see that it's reversed. So this is from Christian service. By the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy and the violation of God's law, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. When Protestantism so stretch her hand across the gulf, to grasp the hand of the Roman power. So in the other one, she's going to stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. But in this one, she stretches her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power. And it's mentioned first. So she always mentions the stretching hand across the gulf first, and then the abyss second. But here she has reversed the gulf and the abyss. And I don't know if that's significant. And this is a quote from Testimonies to the Church, or for the Church. And it's it's volume 5, 451. So 
So even though it's in this book, Christian Service, this, then you're going to see this quote again. As far as I know, there's just the two quotes. So if I look at the, the other ones, you're going to see again, this is just darkness before dawn here, forever those are. And then you've got the Great Controversy one. So in the Great Controversy, the United States will stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism, right? So that's the one. Where it's always the, a gulf and then abyss, but spiritualism and the Roman power are switched. So you can see that in the 1888. Um, and this one's just a condensed great controversy. So stretches her hand across, across the gulf to clasp the hand of spiritualism. And then this one here, testimonies for the church. So as far as I know, those are the two quotes. The one in the great controversy and the one in, and, and when you see it in, in the spirit of prophecy, volume four, uh, stretch your hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism and over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. So I'm just looking, making sure that these are just the two options. Yeah. You see the Maranatha. Okay. okay. So you see it both ways. Okay. Does that mean anything? That, that she has these two different ways of describing it. Always first stretching the hand across the gulf to either grasp the hand of the Roman power or spiritualism. And then she always has second reaching over the abyss to clasp hands with either spiritualism or the Roman power. So the question is, is there any significance in this that we can see? Like, what does it mean? Why does she, why does she switch them? You know, I mean, I mean, to me, if she had said, you know, grasp hands with the Roman power and clasp hands across the abyss. You know, she's, she, if she always had the gulf connected with Rome and she always had the abyss connected with spiritualism, it wouldn't matter to me if she switches the order in which she says them. But she actually switches the gulf. Sometimes it refers to the Roman power and sometimes to spiritualism and sometimes the abyss to the Roman power or spiritualism. But she always has the gulf first and the abyss second. Is there any significance in that? Or am I just picking at, at details that don't matter? Well, I'm thinking of, of, of uh, Revelation 20, when Satan is tossed into the abyss. I mean, the gulf, okay, you're stretching your, your hand to grasp something foreign. that would normally be foreign to you, and you're trying to befriend it and ally with it. It's like a separation that suddenly spanned, right? And then the abyss, well, I'm thinking of judgment of Satan, judgment of his followers. Oh, okay. Best letters. Well, see, I would think of, you know, the gulf and the abyss. I mean, there's a gulf. It's, it's, it's something between. So we know the idea of this. Um, well, let's do a word study. Let's, so let's, let's actually look at this in a bit more detail now. Of course, we're dealing with the statement in the spirit of prophecy, but she's using spiritual language. So we're going to look up the word gulf. So this is the one I was thinking of, Luke 16, verse 26. So this is uh, the parable dealing with the rich man and Lazarus. Now, my understanding is that this is a story that would be told to children so that they would become, you know, seek to become rich rather than to be a beggar. Now, Jesus turns this story on its head. So this, this would just be a story. It's not, it's not like something that actually happened. So it's a parable. And he's taking this story that was used for children, and he takes Lazarus, this beggar, as the one that actually goes to Abraham's bosom. Nobody really believes that when you die, you go into Abraham's bosom. I mean, it doesn't really make sense. So you wouldn't take it literally. But a kid might take it literally. But definitely no. Yes, they do. They do. Oh, I've had I had plenty of people tell. <laughs> so so you really think that they're going to go into Abraham's bosom? That everybody. Yeah. Knows and you know what my response is? I, yeah, I I agree. I just had this talk with an evangelical, and they really believe that once you die, you you know, if you're saved, and he believes apparently at once saved, always saved. That's what it sounds like when I hear him talk. They go yeah. immediately, immediately yeah. to heaven. And that's what he was standing on this parable. I didn't say anything at the time, but I'm going to. This is just ridiculous. Hey, and, and what, I, I, it's what, I respond, what I respond with is, well, how big is Abraham's bosom? If well, Abraham's got a bosom that's got all these people in it. Yeah, well, that's, that's, not even, that's not even the real issue. The real issue is why Abraham, you know, because this is a story for Jews. 
it, obviously they're not really thinking, they're not mature in that sense of, of their ability to understand language. And, and we don't take many of the other parables literally. Now, here in this story, when he's in, in torments, you know, the rich man is going to, where is it here? Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou would ascend him to my father's house, for I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Now, the five brethren would be the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Herodians, the Zealots, and the Essenes. Those are the five sects of Judaism, right? So there's obviously a symbolism here. And then, of course, and, and Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, nay, father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So we can see, obviously, the parallel there has to do with being raised from the dead. Now, we also know that Lazarus is raised from the dead. Did people believe when Lazarus was raised from the dead? Did the Jews believe? No, they actually sought to kill him. So we can see that there's a lot of symbolism here in this parable. But the main thing that we're looking at here is not so much the parable. Here we're looking at the word, word golf. So, of course, we know we're dealing with, with a Greek word that's been translated into English as golf. But Ellen White is talking about this. So if I think about a golf, this is a person who is dead and he wants to uh, get a, um, I guess, what is it he says here? He just wants a, a, some water a, on his tongue and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. Now, you have to think about this parable, too, in what this means. So Lazarus is this poor man, this beggar who, who goes into Abraham's bosom when he dies. And, and the rich man, he's going to call for Lazarus to do this. So obviously, this isn't, it isn't a true story. Right. I mean, why Lazarus? Obviously, it, it has to do with an illustration here of what Lazarus represents. Um, now, what does Lazarus represent? If Dwight was here. He would tell us because Lazarus is God's spirit because it means God, God's helper. Right. OK. So the word Lazarus is Eliezer, the name of two Israelites. So and it says here one imaginary uh, Lazarus. So, so this relates to, uh, the word Eliezer, which is in Hebrew. I'm just going to go there. 499. God has helped. The high priest son of Aaron. But also the priest who rebuilt and dedicated the restored walls of Jerusalem in the time of Ezra, right? So that's where we was, we're connecting this to, uh, the story of Ezra. So there's this connection here of this, this gulf. Right. So this golf and Lazarus. Now, I mean, obviously, if you're in torments being burned in a flame, would having somebody come and put a drop of water on your tongue give you any comfort? Like a drop of water on your tongue is not going to really matter. So so what is the symbolism here? What does the water represent? What is it that the rich man wants? I know I'm going more into the interpretation of this parable, but. He wants to be freed from hell, and the only escape out of hell is to receive Christ as Savior in this life. Yeah. You can't do it in the next. There okay. is none well, in the next. You're taking it too literally still here. I'm talking about in symbolic sense. So the idea of water, would this not represent the Holy well, Spirit? the Spirit, I keep thinking the Spirit of God, the water, the water of regeneration. So, you know, if, if we're going to take this and we apply it like to Millerite history, the parable of the ten virgins, it, w- it would be similar to that idea. The idea that give me of your oil. Right. Uh-huh. But here a probation has closed. Right. So this is talking about a close of probation. You know, once you die, your probation is closed and there is not. And, and we think about this, too. Um, Ellen White talks about after the close of probation, Adventists who recognize their mistake, I I can't remember exactly how she words it, but basically they want something from the people that have have followed God from the 144,000, but there's nothing that they can do for them. And and this is just sort of showing this this hopelessness of this situation. But but the idea that there's this 
this goal fix. So because of this goal, he can't, he can't go there. So he, he couldn't even go there if he wanted. And, and so this gulf would represent that, that gulf between that, that a person has his probation closed, that there's a gulf now fixed. So if we think about this gulf that they reach their hand across, can we relate it at all to this gulf? That's basically the question. So, so we'll keep that in mind. Let's look up the word abyss. Now, that's going to be here a few more times. So golf only occurs uh, once. Did I spell abyss right? Or maybe that's not the word. I guess abyss isn't as a word. Isn't abyss in the Bible? Unless they spell it differently. How would I look that up? There's a void. No abyss. Okay. What, what's, the word, what's the word I would find or how would I spell that? Okay, we got the word void. And let me do it this but there's got to be a miss in there. So I think Revelation 20, verse 2, where it talks about the bottomless pit. I think in Greek, that's uh, it's, 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 Yeah, so it's just the Greek word abyssos. So bottomless, that's what I have to look up in the King James. If I looked it up in another translation, I would be able to find abyss. But the King James, I guess, doesn't use that word. Okay, so let's, let's do it this way. So when we look at Revelation 9:11, so we got this word bottomless pit, and you can see that that word is abyssos. Okay, so that's the word I'm going to look up. I'm going to look up that uh, Greek word. So and, and then I'm going to look up the Hebrew word for it as well. So we're going to see this in Revelation 9, verse 1 and 2. So this fifth angel sounds. You see this star fall from heaven onto the earth. This is Muhammad. He has the key of the bottomless pit. He opens the bottomless pit. So that's the abyss. Revelation 9.11 also has it. He's the angel of the bottomless pit, the king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit. So one of the things that, that's interesting about this abyss, and, and this is something that um, we, we did studies on uh, in the past. But when we deal with the Babylon, it has three parts, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. One thing we have to say is that Islam is part of the dragon power based upon this bottomless pit idea. It, it's spiritualism. Islam is a form of spiritualism. Now, it's not atheistic communism. It's definitely not wokeism, but it's of the same spirit. And, and that is there are lots of different things that we would include in that third part of Babylon. Right. We got the dragon power, that's all of this pagan things, even if they contradict each other, even if they're in opposition with each other, they're still all part of that. The Catholic Church is this papal power. It's paganism clothed in Christianity. And then you have the false prophet. Now, the false prophet is Protestantism that has apostatized. So the false prophet is this other power. And primarily we see this as the United States, but it, it is the religious West. Um, the Christian West, right? So it's not papal, but that power is going to combine with these other powers. Now, we have seen this happening in different ways. So if we think about the abyss, you know, as being, because we think about Islam, right? We think about, well, we got the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, and we have Islam. And Islam is like this enemy, but it's actually part of the dragon power. Right. We can see because it uses those same symbols when it comes to Islam. And if we look at historically, when we have the the fall of of Western Rome, we're going to have uh, the nations that come in these Germanic nations. I mean, they're going to be instrumental. First, they become Catholic, but really they're going to produce the Protestant Reformation. I mean, the Protestant Reformation happens, you know, all through Europe. But Germany is definitely a big part of it, as is uh, the UK or Britain. And then we are going to have the power that destroys Eastern Rome. It's not going to be the Germanic power, but it's going to be Islam. And so you can see how Islam in this history in Revelation 9 is symbolizing uh, this dragon power that's going to be, bring about the end of Eastern Rome, if, if that makes sense. 
So, so Rome is going to be destroyed, both Western Rome and Eastern Rome, by different powers. So in that historical sense, this spiritualism, you know, it changes its form. Now, we know, of course, uh, the power that puts the papacy on the throne of the earth is it's not really spiritualism, right? It's going to be France. But when France uh, takes the pope, the papacy off the throne of the earth in 1798, it's it's going to be France is now going to be the dragon power. Because you can't say it was the dragon power when it put the papacy on the throne of the earth. But it, it is going to take the papacy off the throne of the earth in 1798. But now it is, in a sense, a different power. So I'm not sure how that all relates exactly, all the details of it. But if we're dealing here with the bottomless pit, in, in this context, it's connected with spiritualism. That is, it's connected with, you know, this definitely is not Protestantism. So hopefully that makes sense. Now we see also uh, this bottomless pit, this word, abyssus, is going to be used in, that's not right. No, I think I did that wrong. Stang on. Gonna go back. No, that's right. So Revelation. Oh, it's just I got verse eight. So it has verse as uh, chapter seventeen, verse seven and eight. Right. So it's going to mention the beast which thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. So here, we know that this is the bottomless pit is now in relation to the papal power. Well, or is it? Because remember, there's the mystery of the woman and the beast that carrieth her, which says seven heads and ten horns. Now, it says the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend to the bottomless pit. Well, we, we say that this refers back to the beast of Revelation 13 that comes out of the sea. But it also is going to ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. So we can also say that the papacy is connected to the bottomless pit as well. And then we have Revelation 20, verse 1, and we have an angel that has that comes from heaven that has the key of the bottomless pit, the great chain in his hand, and he's going to lay hold on the dragon, <laughs> that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, right? and cast him into the bottomless pit in verse three and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. So again, you have the abyss here. We also see abyss in Luke 8, 31, and they besought him that he would not command them to go into the deep. These are talking about these devils. So they didn't want to be cast into the abyss. And then Romans 10, verse seven, or who shall ascend into the deep? That is the abyss. That is bring up Christ again from the dead. So here, we can see that the abyss uh, refers to the place of the dead, right? Now, the deep, or, or the gulf, pardon me, the gulf is this separation that happens between those that are saved and those that are lost, right? It has to do with the close of probation. So those are the verses that we have that we can we can look at and study and say, how does that apply? So when we try to apply this to Ellen White's statement, we got Proverbs 23, 27, you're referring me to. It describes a papacy, or a whore is a deep ditch, and a strange woman is a narrow pit. Okay. And there, a pit is a well. So it's a different word. But, okay. So if we, if we go back to this. So, so we have these statements, anyway. We have these two statements of Ellen White. One's from Fifth, Fifth Testimonies. The other one's from The Great Converse. And if we're trying to relate what has happened or what will happen, is there any significance that she switches these or is it just, you know, they're equivalent that, that the abyss and the gulf are really the same thing. And she's just, she's just using this in a poetic sense. And it doesn't really matter that she says first that they, they stretch their hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power in 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 the great controversy and in five testimonies they they stretch their hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism and in the great controversy she switches that they grasp they stretch across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism and then they reach across the 
uh, abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. So they switched. Is that significant? It, it is a detail that's there, uh, but does it mean anything? Is it just incidental? Or should we, we read into it that, that there's some implication of that? And it's not saying that one happens first and one happens next. Like it's not showing it uh, chronologically. It's not then they, it's just they, they do this. The United States does this. But can we say that there are two different times in which this is done? That is, that it's not referring exactly to the same event. Is, is that possible? Or is there some other way in which we should understand this? I know it's not a, a straightforward uh, problem. You know, it, it, it could be that, you know, I just, I notice this detail. I don't know if it's meaningful, but we have a gulf, which is something that separates and we have a bit, the abyss, which represents basically the place of the dead. Can we relate this at all to what's, what has happened or what will happen? Because if we look at January 6th, 2021, I mean, this is a connection with spiritualism, right? This is when the United States is defeated by the King of the South. Is it next that the United States will be defeated by the papacy in some way? Is that how we look at it when there is this, this backlash? There's, there's something we're not seeing. Because remember, we understand this as Raffi and Pinium. Now, Raffi and Pinium, of course, are earlier in this history. But we know Raffi represents 1798 and Pinium represents 1989 because the king of the south defeats the king of the north and then the king of the north defeats the king of the south. So is there some way in which we can understand that this, this clasping the hand with spiritualism, these, these defeatings of these, these previous battles are, are a history that is going to be marking the times of the end, right? They're also going to be typifying something happening in our time. But when they clasp hands, when the United States clasps hands with spiritualism or the Roman power and reaches across the Gulf uh, to grasp the hand of either Roman power or spiritualism, whichever one you're going to take, this is a threefold union. This is the Sunday law. And I don't think, we obviously know we're not at the Sunday law yet. But that Sunday law is more than just the Sunday law in the United States. That threefold union is, is something that happens after the close of probation in its entirety, right? So we know we first start with the Sunday law in the United States, a national Sunday law. The Sunday law is progressive, it begins in the United States. It moves to the rest of the world. But we know this is also connected to the image of the beast. So, so how do we understand that? When does this occur? So if we go back to these statements in the spirit of prophecy, I mean, the one in uh, the great controversy itself, here, I'm going to first read the one uh, that's in five testimonies. This will help us a little bit. Okay, so here's the one in five testimonies. Okay, the same masterful mind that plotted against the faithful in ages past is still seeking to rid the earth of those who fear God and obey his law. Satan will excite indignation against the humble minority who conscientiously refuse to accept popular customs and traditions. And we can see uh, the indignation there is we have that the, the end of the indignation referred to in verse 36 of Daniel 11. Anyway, men of position and reputation will join with the lawless and the vile and take counsel against the people of God. Wealth, genius, education will combine to cover them with contempt. Persecuting rulers, ministers, and church members will conspire against them. With voice and pen, by boasts, threats, and ridicule, they will seek to overthrow their faith. By false representations and angry appeals, they will stir up the passions of the people, not having it thus set the scriptures to bring against the advocates of the Bible Sabbath. They will resort to oppressive enactments to supply the lack. To secure popularity and patronage, legislators will yield to the demand for a Sunday law. So this comes from all kinds of other sources. Like the legislators yield to it. Those who fear God, 
cannot accept an institution that violates the precept of a precept of the Decalogue. On this battlefield comes the last great conflict of the controversy between truth and error. And we are not left in doubt as to the issue. Now, as in the days of Mordecai, the Lord will vindicate his truth and his people. So in this story, it's going to be talking about, and I probably could have read all of this earlier, the dragon was wroth with the woman to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Now that verse, so if we take this, that's in Revelation 12, verse 17, right? So that's the the verse. Now, if we think about this in Revelation, so let's go there, actually. So it says, you know, the earth helped the woman. So, right, we've, we've studied this in Daniel chapter 11. So the earth helps the woman. That's going to be where? That the earth helps the woman. What historical point? It's uh, the United States of America, where we find that uh, it's to do with uh, the Constitution. So it's, it's the setting up of the United States of America. And we would just mark it there, 1798, you know, once the United States is this two-horned beast that rises, right? So, so we're going to mark it at the end of the 1260, at the end of the indignation. Once the indignation is accomplished, the earth has helped the woman. And we have the Protestant United States. We're going to have, after 1798, we're going to have the Book of Daniel open. We're going to have uh, all these international Bible societies, but especially the American Bible Society, publishing Bibles. Right. That's Daniel standing in his lot, in a sense, at the end of days. And that's going to swallow up the flood. So this persecution, of course, it's going to end before 1798. But we're just saying it's marking that history. And then it says, and the dragon was wroth with the woman to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Well, that's referring to after 1844. Can we say that? So we can see that all of this, that pagan Rome, this dragon power, is going to be persecuting this seed of the woman. It's going to fly into the wilderness for 1260 years. But then the serpent casts out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman. But she's going to then be helped by the earth, the United States. And that flood is going to be swallowed up. But the dragon is going to be wroth with the woman and makes war against the remnant of her seed, that is, of this woman, there is a remnant, right? We say that that's Seventh-day Adventists, right? Those are the ones that keep the commandments of God and have the spirit of prophecy. So, so that's referring to our history. So you can see how quickly it moves through that history in these verses. So just going back, and I just wanted to clarify that from uh, the spirit, what we're reading here in the spirit of prophecy of what she's talking about in this coming crisis. In the near future, we shall see these words fulfilled as the Protestant churches unite with the world and with the papal power against the commandment keepers. So uniting with the world, that's reaching the hand across the abyss to clasp the hands with spiritualism. And the papal power, that's stretching the hands across the gulf to grasp the hands of the papal power. The same spirit which actuated papists in ages past will lead Protestants to pursue a similar course toward those who will maintain their loyalty to God. Church and state are now making preparations for the future conflict. Um, Protestants are working in disguise to bring Sunday to the front, as did the Romanists. Throughout the land, the papacy is piling up her lofty and massive structures in the secret recesses of which her former persecutions are to be repeated. The way is preparing for the manifestation on a grand scale of those lying wonders by which, if it were possible, Satan would deceive even the elect. So we know that that's something that happens after the close of probation, that he tries to deceive, if possible, because it's not possible to deceive the elect, but he's going to attempt to. And then she says, the decree which is to go forth against the people of God will be very similar to that issued by Ahasuerus against the Jews in the time of Esther. The Persian edict sprang from the malice of Haman toward Mordecai. Not that Mordecai had done him harm, but he had refused to show him reverence, which belongs only to God. The king's decision against the Jews was secured under false pretenses, 
through misrepresentation of that peculiar people. Satan instigated the scheme in order to rid the earth of those who preserve the knowledge of the true God. But his plots were defeated by a counterpower that reigns among the children of men. Angels that excel in strength were commissioned to protect the people of God, and the plots of their adversaries were turned upon their own heads. The Protestant world today see in the little company keeping the Sabbath a Mordecai in the gate. His character and conduct expressing reverence for the law of God are constant rebuke to those who have cast off the fear of the Lord and are trampling upon his Sabbath. The unwelcome intruder must, by some means, be put out of the way. So that's when she says, the same masterful mind that plotted against the faithful in ages past is still seeking to rid the earth of those who fear and obey his law. Satan will excite indignation against the humble minority who conscientiously refuse to accept popular customs and traditions. Men of position and reputation will join with the law in the list and vile. So we've read all of that. So by the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will dis- disconnect herself fully from righteousness. So that has not yet happened, but it will. So it says, when Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism, when, under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. As the approach of the Roman armies was to sign, was assigned to the disciples of the impending destruction of Jerusalem, so may this apostasy be assigned to us that the limit of God's forbearance is reached, that the measure, measure of our nation's iniquity is full, and that the angel of mercy is about to take her flight, never to return. The people of God will then be plunged into those scenes of affliction and distress which prophets have described as the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, the time of Jacob's trouble occurs after the close of probation. Doesn't occur occur before. The cries of the faithful persecuted ones ascend to heaven. And as the blood of Abel cried from the ground, there are voices also crying to God from martyrs' graves. So the martyrs will already have died. They died before the close of probation. From the sepulchres of the sea, from mountain caverns, from covenant Convent vaults. How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? The Lord is doing his work. All heaven is astir. The judge of all the earth is soon to arise and vindicate his insulted authority. The mark of deliverance will be set upon the men who keep the commandments of God, who revere his law, and who refuse the mark of the beast in his image. God has revealed what is to take place in the last days, that his people may be prepared to stand against the tempest of opposition and wrath. Those who have been warned of the events before them are not to sit in calm expectation of the coming storm, comforting themselves that the Lord will shelter his faithful ones in the day of trouble. We are to be as men waiting for their Lord, not in idle expectancy, but in earnest work with unwavering faith, faith, It is no time now to allow our minds to be engrossed with things of minor importance. While men are sleeping, Satan is actively arranging matters so that the Lord's people may not have mercy or justice. The Sunday movement is now making its way in darkness. The leaders are concealing the true issue, and many will unite in the movement. And many who unite in the movement do not themselves see whither the undercurrent is tending. Its professions are mild and apparently Christian, but when it shall speak, it will reveal the spirit of the dragon. It is our duty to do all in our power to avert the threatened danger. We should endeavor to disarm prejudice by placing ourselves in a proper light before the people. We should bring before them the real question at issue, thus interposing the most effectual protest against measures to restrict liberty of conscience. We should search the scriptures and be able to give the reason for our faith. Says the prophet, the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. 
So in that quote there from uh, Testimonies for the Church, it, it's very similar to what we see in um, uh, the Great Controversy. But uh, but here there's there's quite a bit more. So we 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 have that paragraph that's similar. Um, but she's going to go into much more detail here. So she says a spiritualism more closely imitates the nominal Christianity of the day. As spiritualism, pardon me, more closely imitates the nominal Christianity of the day. It has greater power to deceive and ensnare. Satan himself is converted after the modern order of things. He will appear in the character of an angel of light. Through the agency of spiritualism, miracles will be wrought. The sick will be healed. And many undeniable wonders will be performed. And as the spirits who profess faith in the Bible and manifest respect for the institutions of the church, their work will be accepted as a manifestation of divine power. The line of distinction between professed Christians and the ungodly is now hardly distinguishable. And we, we can see that, of course, much clearer today. Church members love what the world loves and are ready to join with them. And Satan determines to unite them in one body and thus strengthen his cause by sweeping all into the ranks of spiritualism. Papists who boast of miracles as a certain sign of the true church will be readily deceived by this power working, wonder working power. And Protestants, having cast away the shield of truth, will be deluded. Papists, Protestants, and worldlings will all alike accept the form of godliness. So we could say the papal power, the United States, and spiritualism, right? He's the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. So we've got the, the beast, that's the papist, Protestants, the false prophet, and the worldlings are the dragon. We'll accept the form of godliness without the power. And we'll see in this union a grand movement for the conversion of the world and the ushering in of the long-expected millennium. Through spiritualism, Satan appears as a benefactor of the race, healing the diseases of the people and professing to present a new and more exalted system of religious faith. But at the same time, he works as a destroyer. His temptations are leading multitudes to ruin. Intemperance dethrones reason, sensual indulgence, strife and bloodshed follow. Satan delights in war, for it excites the worst passions of the soul, and then sweeps into eternity its victims steeped in vice and blood. It is in his object to incite the nations to war against one another, for he can thus divert the minds of the people from the work of preparation to stand in the day of God. So, so you can see it's, it's put in a, in a context much more relating to uh, spiritualism. So if we look at this quote, then she says she has here spiritualism first. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the Gulf to grasp the hands of spiritualism. In the one in uh, Testimonies, Volume 5, she's going to say the United States will be the foremost in stretching their hands across the Gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power. There she's going to address more the Roman power. Here she's going to address more spiritualism. Okay? So that could be the reason why she mentions it first. I don't know. But but you can see that there is these, these differences. Now, the one thing that we can say from from what we have read is that right now we are in this conflict. We have a battle between the king of the north and the king of the south. We have a battle between Republicans and Democrats. We're going to have a civil war in the United States. But at some point, all of these powers will unite. Can we agree on that? And, yes. Yeah. And that this will be seen as the solution to the conflicts that occur before that. So right now we have these conflicts, the king of the north, the king of the south. You know, who's the good one? Who's the bad one? Right. Most would we would say, well, obviously, wokeism is a terrible thing. What's happening? Uh, you know, there's no freedom of speech. You know, we're being censured. Um, you know, we're having this, this basically a fascist state um, under the Democrats and under the left. You know, we have all these things, you know, with the WHO and, and um, these treaties they want to form, these health treaties and, you know, all these terrible things. And we have, you know, the World Economic Forum. 
And so, so people are fighting against that. But once we see the backlash, I mean, you still are going to have to have all of these powers. That is the Democrats and the Republicans. That is everybody is going to have to agree, even though it's clothed in this Christian sort of way, because that's what she's saying here is that spiritualism is more closely imitating the nominal Christianity of the day. So we know that papalism clothed itself in Christianity. So does spiritualism, that, that this is going to see, seem like something really good, that everyone, no matter their, their views, except for God's people, will see as a good thing. They won't see it as a compromise. You know, they will see it as, as a solution, as a, as somehow something amazing is happening to unite all of these forces, all these ideologies, and that everyone's working together to solve these problems. Right now, we just see conflict. You know, at, at every turn, there's conflict. But at some point, when these powers unite, it will appear to be the end of conflict, except that those that are not in agreement, which will be the ones who are keeping the commandments of God and have the spirit of prophecy. They're the ones that are not going to conform to this wonderful working. Now that, of course, I think that, that unity is, is going to begin before the close of probation. But I think primarily what she's talking about here is, is really at the end. There's going to be this, this wonderful working of Satan. Uh, we're going to see that unity as the thing that is going to be that test to the 144,000 because it will appear that they are the, the outcasts of the earth. They're the ones who are the problem. Even to themselves, it will appear that way because they don't see in themselves any good thing, but yet they know to cling to God. And, and so this is progressive. I think that often people are looking for things to happen. We know the, the, the final events will be rapid ones, but they're looking for the wrong events. That is, when they yield to uh, the National Sunday Law, for instance, it's not going to appear to be something that is contrary for Seventh-day Adventists, contrary to what they believe. They're just They're not going to see the dangers. In fact, they're going to be the ones promoting it. So at least many Adventists will be. So when we look at what's happening now, if we go back to trying to understand this verse, verse 36, I think it, it is describing uh, the end of this period of time and the beginning of our period of time. So we know that Jeff speaks 1260 days after uh, July 18, 2020. So there is a symbol there of 1260. But we also have, you know, the 1290, the 1335. And we don't know what, how particularly that relates. We just know that we have that 45 years and that refers to, to Trump. All I'm saying is that this idea that, that Trump is going to be bringing in the Sunday law needs to be something that is set aside. He has fulfilled his role. We are now at the end of that period. We're at the end of that 45 years in, in this present truth application that we're applying to our movement right now. So that Sunday law crisis is the crisis dealing with the pandemic in this context. But we are in the Sunday law crisis ever since 9-11. And that Sunday law crisis has had its type in the pandemic. And we have seen the Battle of Raphia in type in January 6, 2021. And, and we're going to see a return back to a public Republican government, I believe. But also a lot of conflict. And, and we just don't know exactly how it's going to unfold. Uh, we don't know if Trump's going to be elected. We don't know if, if there's going, you know, exactly how we're going to have, don't understand Angela's writing in code. So we don't know how the civil war is going to pan out. What exactly is going to happen? I do believe there's going to be a civil war. How that's going to come come about, I don't know. But we just know what God has shown us. And, and we need to continue to study these things. We need to continue to watch and wait. So hopefully that was helpful for today. And we're going to try to move on 
We're going to create, uh, draw some of this stuff out on lines as well again, but maybe this week. Uh, but we want to look at uh, verses 37 to 39. We want to start looking at those and putting in the present truth application. And that may help us refine some of this stuff in red that we have here. Probably one thing I would say here with this is just if I put that in there, that might help. Okay, so uh, let's close with prayer. The dear Father in heaven, I thank you for the study this morning. I pray for each person that you can be with them, be with Dwight and his mom and his family. And um, we ask, Lord, that you can be with our families and the needs that we have. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.